Okay, lovely to have a reasonably big turnout. Even if there's three people, it's still good enough for me. <laughs> so uh, we've got one, one um, sort of one moderate length and two short ones, but if anyone wants to go over another one at the end, make it worth our while. So if you can think of anything whatsoever, just take these two volumes at any time and... Um, just dial it up and then we'll just go over it slowly so you've got time to do some input if you choose. So you can take those two volumes uh, at any time. So we'll start with the counterfeit of the True Dharma, which is um, the Samyutta 16, page 680 to 681. So I'll read it through and then I'll just, as we go... Hmm, I'll just, I'll just stop here, I'll just stop here and there, just in case you want to uh, make some input. And I basically, while, while we're doing this sort of formulation, I won't uh, give any input until... Uh, you, if, when you, if you want to interject, just, just indicate, and I'll read it through, and then you can basically give me your input, and then I'll, I'll tell you what I think at the very end. So basically, I don't um, don't sort of rob you, so to speak. So counterfeit of the true Dhamma. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jetta's Grove, and under Pindicus Park. Then the Venerable Mahakasapa approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, "Venerable Sir, what is the reason? What is the cause?" why formerly there were fewer training rules, but more bhikkhus were established in final knowledge, while now there are more training rules, but fewer bhikkhus, bhikkhus, are, or say bhikkhunis, are established in final knowledge. That's the way it is, Kasapa. When beings are deteriorating and the true Dharma is disappearing, there are more training rules, but fewer bhikkhus are established in final knowledge, Kasapa, the true Dhamma does not disappear so long as a counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen in the world. But when a counterfeit of the true Dhamma arises in the world, then the true Dhamma disappears. Just as Kasapa, gold does not disappear so long as counterfeit gold has not arisen in the world. But when counterfeit gold arises, then true gold disappears. So the true Dhamma does not disappear so long as a counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen in the world. But when a counterfeit of the true Dhamma arises in the world, then the true Dhamma disappears. It is not the earth element, Kasapa, that causes the true Dhamma to disappear, nor the water element, nor the heat element, nor the air element. It is the senseless people who arise right here, who caused the true Dhamma to disappear. The true Dhamma does not disappear all at once in the way a ship sinks. There are, Kasapa, five detrimental things that lead to the decay and disappearance of the true Dhamma. What are the five? Here the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, male lay followers and female lay followers dwell without reverence and deference towards the teacher. They dwell without reference and deference towards the Dhamma. They dwell without reference and deference towards the Sangha. They dwell without reference and deference towards the training. They dwell without reference and deference towards concentration. These kasapa are the five detrimental things that lead to the decay and disappearance of the true Dhamma. The, there are five things kasapa that lead to the longevity of the true Dhamma to its non-decay and non-disappearance. What are the five? Here the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, male followers, female followers, dwell with reference and deference towards the teacher. They dwell with reference and deference towards the Dhamma. They dwell with reference and deference towards the Sangha. They dwell with reference and deference towards the training and concentration. These kasapa are the five things that lead to the longevity of the true Dhamma, to its non-decay and none disappearance. So what do you people think? Have you got any personal viewpoints, angles, objectives? Don't be afraid to say anything whatsoever. And Lynn?
So, sorry, I can barely hear you. Do the lay... Is that is it better? Um, is it switched on? Just wait till the, maybe the, the other mic, just see how you go. Yeah, it's just your voice is a bit soft, voice is a bit soft. I just think it's very interesting to see in this sutta that, that our role as, as lay people is important in keeping the Dhamma alive in the world. I thought, I thought yeah, it's it's exactly right, because you've got this dependent relationship between the lay disciples and the monastics, and essentially we can't, we can't survive without each other. In this particular tradition, the Theravadan tradition, we maintain the uh, dependency, maintain the uh, connection, because you, you, you find that um, overall the, the training on both sides um, maintains its um, effectiveness, because um, what, what, what happens is when you've, when, you've got the, when you've got the dependency relationship, you've got uh, essentially a core principle is you've, you've got the checks and balances in place. So if the, if the monks and nuns are training properly, behaving themselves, fulfilling their, their obligations, and you know, uh, are quite reasonable role models for the, um, the lay Buddhist community, then you will always get enough support to uh, keep the communities going, to, to pay the bills, um, you know, to cover the building projects, any kind of infrastructure, um, you know, basically wh whatever kind of, um, say, formal community engagement, interaction activities, um, you're able to sustain that for, for the maintenance and the growth of the, say, both the, for the facility. Because the thing is that, you know, even, even though we have the monastery there, you know, the, mo the monastery is there for all Buddhists, but not only the Buddhists, because um, on the last Thursday, we had a visit from the uh, Sikh community, and, and these people, they, they were in the, the say, the, the more, uh, not old, but, you know, in the, the say, the, the middle age to older um, age group, you know, you're looking at, like, minimum, say, mid-50s up to 70-odd, and, um, you know, these people are quite focused, and they're quite dedicated as far as their, their Sikh culture and uh, religious training. But with these people, they're very keen on meditation, and they don't they don't have the kind of very broad um, understanding, uh, the tools, the experience, knowing how to work with the practice, um, the way the Buddhists do. They they do with the Sikhs. They 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 do. Uh, they spend a lot of time on, um, say, contemplation, religious contemplation of their their teachings, their their, their Sikh dharma, so to speak. And um, but they. Which is, you know, which is still quite reasonable. It's, it can be quite effective, um, but they they don't have that very broad uh, base, very broad perspective that we have with the, especially on the meditation side. Because when it comes to meditation, we essentially we basically we we know it all. Um, you know, we know more about meditation than virtually you know than any other culture uh, in the world. So, but what's happened is the, these people, they're quite keen to come up, so there'll be at least a handful after rains will come up. So um, I just let Chunda know that like, they can pop up. They've done this kind of contemplative meditation, probably some very, uh, say, like mantra formulation, mild, um, uh, so, you know, parikama uh, style practice for over quite a number of years. So, you, you know, you can basically just have them up there for... A couple of days, and um, but the, these people in themselves, they're quite. Even though you can see culturally, they're very focused on their own um, particular style, you know, a religious style and practice. That um, they're very, very keen, you know, very keen to um, uh, to learn different meditation practices and actually incorporate it within the Sikh uh, Sikh culture. But the people in themselves, they're quite, they're very, they're quite nice, you know, quite nice people. They, they come across, they were quite serious. And, but the, these people, they're not to be underestimated because the questions, uh, I've only done one session with these people and the questions that they asked were easily the toughest questions I've ever come across. I haven't done a lot of teaching in, in the, say, the local or, um, um, you know, uh, fraternity, local fraternity or, or uh, uh, extended, uh, extended boundaries, but um, these, yeah, these people, a lot of the very intelligent, and their ability to actually investigate, asking really, really sharp 
almost, I wouldn't say challenging, but um, the kind of, you know, quite deep, profound questions and in, engaging dialogue. You know, it, it seems that they, they seem to develop this as a skill because they've got this, they've got the, uh, a main meditation practice which is based on investigation and inquiry into their own spiritual teaching. They've got this sharpness, you know, when, when I was talking with them, some of the, some of the, it was some of the sharpest dialogue I've come across for quite some time and, and that, you know, they, they want to know why the, uh, the monastics don't work, you know, how we... Uh, how we keep the the, the monasteries um, in the monastic communities rolling, you know how we um, how we conduct ourselves as far as um, uh, community etiquette. What's the relationship between us between the monastics and the lay community? And um, some quite in, quite interesting sort of challenging uh, questions, which is quite good. You know, if you if I, if I want to test any of the junior monks, you just you just put them put them in a group with um, with these people. It'd be quite interesting. But um, so, yeah, maintaining that that um, that state of uh, dependency. So, if the monastic communities are fulfilling their uh, obligations, res- responsibilities, you can get you, de- you can get enough support to keep the um, the communities rolling. And on the on the uh, on the lay fraternity, you know, the the, the role of the monastics is to you know uh, support the, uh, the the general community with their practice, help you know keep people on track. Uh, focused, you know, um, um, you know, if they have any difficulties or uh, or whatnot, you know, within the within the teaching group, you know, trying to deepen people's um, understanding of, uh, let's say, Buddha Dhamma. But um, just, I probably only gave you about fifty percent there, Lynn. I just sort of lost my my track. Yeah, because the thing is, you know, with the with the lay disciples, I I, I and, and I always push this to on a regular basis. Is um, you know, just I mean, it, it it it's more of an Asian cultural nuance. But uh, you know, the with with any of the lay disciples, whether whether they're Asian or Western, I I always have this tendency to to push people at least to a small degree with their personal practice. You know, just don't just don't think about. Um, say you know, uh, say generosity in the five precepts. I mean, really make a decent effort within the limit of your faculties to develop, you know, the f- the full, um, you know, the full aspects, the full foundation principles of um, the training. Because you know, even if even if I was in, I mean, I wouldn't be basically, essentially, I wouldn't be uh, crazy enough to go back to lay life. I mean, I just can't see the point. Um, but the the way the way I see it, even if I was in lay life, that I mean, I would I would really be paying a lot of attention to sharpening mindfulness and investigation. You know, I would keep the precepts as best um, as possible. But but all the underlying factors with you know with with energy and developing skill in contemplation and um, uh, developing uh, you know certain like perceptions. You know, I'm, I'm really. Doing a lot of, I do a lot. I spend like a couple of hours on on developing the perception of, of um, emptiness, which I find quite quite good. So whenever whenever I teach um, any of the lay disciples, I I always push that. You know, look at the big picture. Just don't just don't settle for you know just sort of bare um, foundation principles because you know you can easily draw in many of the of the you know you've got thirty seven enlightenment factors. And um, you know, it's it's a, it's a good idea to draw of as many of those in as possible, and um, you know, to even actually use them as a contemplator. I, I knew one Sri Lankan person who um, would actually go right through the different, the full sets, and he would go right through the the thirty seven factors, and he would investigate each one because this guy was highly, highly intellectual, almost bordering on sub brilliant, and um, very, very sharp mind, sharp as a razor. And he would um, go through each 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 factor, 
and he would he would he would analyze and investigate it till it was exhausted and then he would move on to the next one he would just do that continually for a full hour or so at a time and he found that practice quite rewarding i mean he found that it give rise to energy give rise to faith and he kept sharpening his understanding because every day or every second day that he, he did that his his knowledge and insight kept increasing you know he may have had difficulty uh, getting peaceful, but for him, that particular tool, that approach to Dhamma was quite um, quite useful. And the thing is, with all of us, you know, we have a, a limited, very limited time span. You know, any of us can be taken at any time, you know, even the monks. You know, we, we, there was a young monk at um, Achan Duns, he only had four reigns, young guy, early 20s and um, took a fall, you know, cracked his, cracked, he, he actually, he passed out, he had a, like a cerebral em embolism or something like that and he fainted, he cracked his skull on the bench top on a marble top, you know, cracked his skull and, uh, and has some severe head injuries and he, he, he died very quickly. So, um, you know, accidents happen, things get uh, very, you know, rare diseases, this and that and, you know, a person, you know, when I because I do so many funerals and I see the that the age range from babies through to very you know people in their eighties and and you know things things happen. You know, one of our Anagaricas, his his grandma, um, she had a she had a like a, a she had a stroke, and um, they didn't find her till um, three days later, and she had severe brain damage, and she was incapacitated uh, in, a, in a wheelchair for the rest of her life and she lived out her years in a, in a reasonably nice nursing facility but that's not the point, it, you know, she, um, she was like late, 50, late 50s and um, quite a sharp woman, very socially engaged and she read and studied and, you know, quite, um, uh, quite an interesting person, her personality uh, and, and her character in general but, and, um, you know, and then her life, you know, with that stroke, because they, they you know, they found her three days later, uh, you know, the severe brain damage took place and, and she was essentially uh, in a vegetative state, you know. So little things like that, I mean, it doesn't happen on a, you know, you don't see it that often, but um, people, you know, they should never, ever get um, complacent that, I mean, you know, things happen, accidents happen, car accidents, um, you know, God knows what else. And uh, your life can just be just cut short, you know. Even you know, I mean, it's, even the people in this room, one of you could be dead within twelve months. You know, even myself, it's quite possible. To, you know, people, uh, you know, trucks, you know, in cars, buses, planes, you know, accidents happen. So it's worth you know, you maximise within the limits of your capability, the limits of your personal life, family life, you know, work, your work commitments. But you maximise the uh, the input because you know you may be in a situation where you you, you can't put forth that uh, kind of energy both either physically um, or mentally. And then you know if you're caught in that situation where things go wrong, that you've got you you know you you don't have to be afraid. You know you've given it full commitment. And even if you know things go wrong, you know you look you know you get life gets taken prematurely. That you're in a very very safe um, perspective. But uh, yeah, you know, so in the monastics, they have, you know, you have more, su you have more suitable conditions. You've got, you know, you've got the time, you know, like, you know, we, we're pretty lucky. We, we only work, you know, at, the, at present, you know, we've got a big community. We're only working four mornings a week. You know, some of us, um, we, we have to do stuff in, in the afternoon or, or whatnot. Um, but, you know, you've got very good, good um, supporting conditions, but you can still work the practice to a very... I mean, quite. I mean, quite a good degree. Even in in lay life, if you know exactly how to set yourself up, um, you know, you look at look at your enlightenment factors, and uh, that's why I put emphasis on these on these those two that you know the mindfulness and um, those first two mindfulness and investigation of of dhammas. You know, joy, joy does arise that when you when you're actually investigating and you're, you're stimulating mental energy, you you get energy uh, actually being stirred, and you get money, energy starts to roll in the mind. You know, it's when when people they they can see that the investigation of dhammas it's it's becoming active as a as a 
principle, but you know, all, the, all these little tricks that I teach people, like you know, just using a meditation word once every 30 seconds and then, and then do it 16, 18 hours a day, and then do your wisdom practice in, this, in that space between the, between the mantras, or, or use uh, like um, awareness of, of colors or sound. Anything which sharpens your mindfulness and where you feel you feel comfortable, you can function, you can think and remember uh, without difficulty. You know, especially if you're working full time. You know, driving a car, you you're within a safe parameter. You can you can function in your day to day life, but you can you know sharpen the mindfulness to its um, greatest uh, degree, and then bring the you know bring the you know especially invest those two are easy to work with mindfulness investigation of dhammas, and then come to a, at least a theoretical understanding of the others and actually pull them into the practice and, um, and, and then just work it to the best of your uh, ability. Mm. Could you please explain how you can uh, investigate the color? In de- developing increasing awareness of color. What what I you just you this is a it's a skill that you actually develop. So as a, even here you know just sitting here or just not, especially trees and forests that really stands out for me. But you 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 actually you do it as a it's a it's a, per, a perception you develop in the mind so you just sit you sit in a suitable environment and just you you it's a it's a it's a tool it's a, a training um you develop just you it's it's more like noticing increase increase your your ability to notice so it's like it's, it's hard for me to explain in words but it's something like when you when you're looking in in the natural world and when you're looking around Actually, I pay attention. The bottom line is you pay attention. You know, re- say for example, if I'm looking at you, and then you, you just that that ja- that the redness of the the jacket or the blueness of the carpet. You know, to really really pay attention to it. Not not just you know. Sometimes we we can be very laissez faire and we can just cruise around and and whatnot. And many, a lot of the time we don't really notice things. But you you, can, you develop it as a as a as a skill within yourself and it definitely it does get you know uh, sharper over time you know so it's like that principle with sound you know with the charm practitioners they they listen to the the, the ear base and they they focus on developing sensitivity to sound but um, some people are comfortable with that one some not but the the, the, the color principle um, you know it's it's a, it's, a, it's a matter the bottom line is paying attention and then the the, sh- the sharpness the increasing awareness follows on after that point so you're looking at applying mindfulness within that particular area, but you you can do it with things like um, what else could you do it with? Even things like like smell, or that, or you just focus on the sound of your body as you as you're moving around. Um, don't don't bother. You don't necessarily have to listen to things outside, but it will still come in. But as you're moving around and doing things and whatnot, actually listen to the rustle of the clothing and the sound of your voice and whatnot. If you if you want to keep the mindfulness you know, within the fear, one's closer to one's personal field, you focus on 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 the 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 sounds, the audible sounds you make. Or some people, um, they meditate on the sound of their heart. Some people uh, have a an inclination for for that practice. You know, because because you you're drawing your attention inwards. You know, into the into the heart, and. Um, you it, it increases one's um, sensitivity, so you can experiment with these practices for I'd, I'd say like a week at a time, and then see what actually works for you. Because um, you know some may you might some you may be very comfortable with, some you may not like uh, whatsoever. You know? But it's all within the field of mindfulness, mindfulness training.
Yeah, so there was also this um, this point, this note um, 219, which was in relation... Actually, no, I got, that was a later, later one. Mm. Yeah, so that business, yeah, so I don't lose that point with the... Um, um, with this particular sutta, there was uh, two points I, I came out there with. With the right in the in the beginning, the um, one of the, the the reasons why the when when the Buddha actually first began his um, his teaching career, that many of the disciples, both on the male and the female side, they they attained to dhamma very very quickly. In, 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 in relation to the people who came after. So what happens was um, with the whole formulation of the, the vinya, um, uh, the monastic discipline for the, uh, both for the monks and the, uh, uh, the bhikkhunis was that uh, in the beginning stages, the, mo- the, the, the people who were in the Buddha's like, inner circle were those group of people who become um, enlightened Say initially the first, you know, the first, or what would you call it? Say first generation of disciples who attained uh, enlightenment, um, yeah, in the beginning after the Buddha began to formally teach, and but those people they they weren't just mainstream people; they were people who had very strong parami, you know. So when you look at the the five the the first five disciples of the Buddha. And um, you know they they all attained within a fairly short space of time. I think, I think the time span. I don't know the exact time span, but it was well within. It was under twelve months for sure. And um, you know just and getting enlightened with a say like a stanza of dhamma. You see, you know, you just imagine if someone enlightens you just by just by um, repeating a few lines. You know, these are not normal people. These are people with really very very powerful parami. Who are right on the edge? They're just ripe. They're just ready. They're just ready for penetration and and for realization of the truth. And because the Buddha, the the Buddha was so, um, you know, essentially, you know, because of his incredible um, wisdom and uh, uh, you know his understanding of people's faculties and characters, that he could see exactly what that person needed in order for them to. Breakthrough, and and he, you know, he was naturally he was able to size people up very very quickly, and you know he could he could spend, I mean he could probably spend a couple of this is just a, an, a, an inference, but he could spend a couple of minutes with a person, and then he could see uh, potentially what what he needed to teach that person in order for them to to realise the dhamma rai. you know, but uh, it might sound quite incredible, but when when you've when, because the, the Buddha was the was the was the was the highest ranking master, you know, within within the um, within the Buddhist tradition, his his parami was at its was at, was at its peak, you know. I mean, right across the, the board, you know, the spiritual param, paramis, the the faculties, the psychic um, uh, ability, you know, things like mind reading and um, you know the ability to understand personality and whether people were of slow, fast intellects and. You know whether you know he, he knew exactly how to approach a person to um, to assist with a breakthrough. But what happened was so they they would say like you, for reference you know for the first generation and um, those people attained very very quickly. Um, but because of their own personal development, these people had had a natural sense of imbued sila morality. They they were people who didn't require constant admonition. Uh, instruction, you know, you know, these, these are the kind of people who just didn't make very, very few mistakes. Their, their, their personal etiquette, their community and, and um, personal etiquette was at quite a high level. And when the Buddha was working with these people, when, these, when he had these people in his, say, as, as first generation disciples, that they created very few problems within the communities, you know, because of their, their, their high personal development. Um, so very few training walls were actually laid down during that time span but you know at a, at a later date as as the Buddha become more famous um, that he drew more and more people into his sphere of influence and then more people were requesting ordination then 
as you get people uh, coming from you know all, you know many different localities even um, other provinces um, you know within the state of uh, within the uh, the borders of india that you you were you were, you were um what's the right words um you know you you had a people with a very uh, a much more broad spectrum of personal karma conditioning personal you know their own def- like defilements and um so you, you know personality characteristics so the after that point you know after you know after, i mean i can't put a t- like a kind of time span on it but possibly after say you know when you the feel that you get with the sutras is after several years that the 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 quality of the people that he was working with that he was instructing that he was assisting with the breakthrough um the quality of these people actually um de- uh, decreased you were getting more you know more still you know quite good people but more like like mainstream you know in the beginning you had the cream and then after that you get people of uh, possibly say like like middle rank and um so with these particular individuals they had to work a lot harder they needed more teaching instruction um and the uh the border when when there were in fact there were in oh, sorry, word infractions there were there were errors there were mistakes made within the community dynamics uh interpersonal behavior the border had to lay down um guidelines you know they had to lay down rules for the uh, essentially for the maintenance and um integrity and harmony of the community because even on the with the monastics like um uh you know some people they feel quite i mean not not necessarily in our monastery um you know i, I mean Achan Bramali is very good with the vinya instruction he knows he easily his his vinya knowledge is, can easily easily match uh, Achan Brahm's possibly even he may even know more than Achan Brahm but Achan Brahm's got very he's very um very experiential so when he when he talks about vinya or dama you know he he's he's got a very very strong feeling sense it's got a, coming from the wisdom basis and um, naturally i mean you know atun sajato bramali they cover the the pali class the uh, say the sutra and the the vinya but i mean if the if the you know if those two weren't around i mean i would be doing it myself and naturally i'd be getting better as i, as I went along <laughs> but um so the as as time went on um you you and the quality of the people decreased you know coming into the buddha circle number of training rules um are uh, increased you you had situations where if you get larger and larger communities you get more people you get more business more interaction more socializing and when it comes down to tin tax if if you re- if you really want to if you really want to go you know what's the right words if you really want to get enlightened in this life um essentially in the west it's very difficult i wouldn't say it's impossible but um it it'll be you know i mean if, if if i saw a second you know i mean we don't have any doubts about acham brom but if i saw a, like a second person actually getting 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 enlightened in this country i'd be i'd be pretty pretty amazed you know because the the thing is that when you look at the chronology you look at the way the buddha did it you look at the way um the old masters from thailand you know a burma to a degree i'm not familiar with the burma circle you've got enlightened people in sri lanka as well but the way these when you look at the, the the life experience of these people they essentially they 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 did it um they did it alone or they did it with a small group of people and they kept themselves right apart from mainstream society they didn't teach i mean it might it may not necessarily be accord with your own views but essentially they they wouldn't they didn't get invo- in, involved with um uh teaching projects social engagements uh to to any great degree they kept themselves isolated they kept themselves apart from people and they didn't really they didn't come out until they actually at least reached that first level you know once you're at the first level you know, as the so uh, as the soda partner you're absolutely absolutely secure there's you know there's um you know you can go you can travel the world you can do whatever you like basically you're absolutely absolutely secure as far as dumb is concerned um but in in essence you look at you look at the life histories and what it takes and you know that's the reality that's what it takes if you know if you if any of you people um if you want to 
attain in this life, uh, the only way you're going to do it really is um, you've got to go to Asia. And um, Sri Lanka's got very good supporting conditions. You can actually live alone or you can live in a small group where you're at least maybe half a kilometre or a kilometre away. Things happen, you know, people have accidents, they get sick, they get bitten by snakes and um, uh, or whatnot. So, um, but, you know, that will, that will maximise uh, your potential because especially on the level of meditation, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to have solitude. Many, many of, the, of the Western meditation monks, they can hold it together but it's very, very difficult to, you know, once you're in the teacher's position, if you haven't got the, um, say, the samadhi virtually mastered, really, um, most people, they, they just can't, they can't hold it together. Um, you don't have any choice. You really, you have to protect yourself to a really constantly, constantly you have to protect the mind. Um, not necessarily, you know, it's not like a, a, a personal thing protecting yourself from other people, but it's your own defilements because the more you engage people, the more, you know, um, you're out in the world, you're doing this, doing that, traveling, um, you, you've got this constant sensory impingement and it's stirring up the underlying uh, defilements in the mind. And um, it just means you have to work a lot harder, you have to become more skillful. Um, and it, it actually makes it more difficult. Even for you know, for myself, I don't. I'm not really. I'm really not concerned with these things anymore because um, I have a personal limit. I don't do more than three or four hours a day, and that's my just that's my limit under any conditions. But um, I've got this mindset, and I'm very, very, you know, I'm very confident in this one that the the next life, you know, especially you know, for you people who um uh, have been long-term practitioners or the monastics who lived the life correctly the vast majority of these people are reborn in in the in the deva realms and you just make your intention very firm you 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 pick the practice up you keep going as soon as you re you take the the next rebirth you keep practicing dhamma you you keep sharpening the meditation the wisdom faculty um the full spectrum of the uh, enlightenment factors because it's the incredible time span the last time I, I, I think from memory, it was about seven, I haven't double-checked it, but something 7.9 million years, and that's just the first Deva realm, the realm of the four great kings. I mean, I've said this many times, but, you know, this, this is, for me, this, um, I find this very, very encouraging, and it gives me a lot of confidence, because even I may, I, I have this sense I won't necessarily make it in this lifetime, but I, I, I can almost guarantee can almost guarantee I'll break through on the second life because it's the as long as the the mind is strong, the intention is very firm, and you don't lose that and you hold your ground. That that second life because of the incredible time span, you know. Uh, the I really believe the vast majority of people, if they if their intent, the intention is strong, that they they will they will break through on that second life just because of the incredible time that you've got. You just imagine, you know. Um, uh, 7.9 you know, million years, you know, that's the full lifespan, maybe shorter for some people. Um, but, yeah, you could really, I mean, do a, an incredible, incredible amount of personal practice. Mm. It's not the four elements outside, but it's, it's senseless people who arise right here. So um, it's just saying that it's not outward conditions, it's conditions within people, it's their attitudes that, that bring about the counterfeit of the dumb. Yeah, yeah. So what example, is, uh, I mean, when the Muslims invaded India and, and like wiped out the, uh, most of the, the victims, how does that match that? How does that what? Yeah, destroyed the Buddhist culture and killed many of the the people practicing in the monasteries. So the what they so, so was there senseless people there that had to be Well you you've had them all the time. You know, if you want to look at if you want to look at um, examples, you have people so called Buddhists actually inside both the monastic and lay communities. If we want to look at the full spectrum, you've got you've got pe you've got people teaching Things which are not in line with Dhamma, which are which are not in line with Vinya, both on the the lay and the monastic 
side, and this is why, um, you know, especially out from Sujato Bramali and myself, we, you, you, you constantly keep referring back to the suttas again and again and again, because if you just follow your own views and, and opinions, which, are, which can be just completely diluted, you know, um, you just, you've only got to, a person's just got to sit down and watch their mind, just watch their thoughts for five minutes and just see some of the crazy stuff which goes on in there. And, um, and then you just see what delusion is really, really made of, just at the surface level. And those defilements are right, you know, they're right through the personality. They compose the personality. And um, this is why, you know, the, for people who destroy these, um, without making it sound too impersonal, but who actually destroy these underlying defilements in Kalesa, um, as an arahant, the, 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 the ego doesn't exist. There's no sense of self. Because the whole, the whole, the whole business from start to, fi- to finish, it's, it's, it's defilement, but all of us, because we, especially with the wisdom faculty, we're moving, you know, we've got enough nouns, we've got uh, enough understanding where we're moving in a direction where we're moving from the unwholesome, you know, we're, we're, we're good people, we have a sense of awareness, a sense of understanding, wisdom, we see the value of this path, the value of, the, of, of Buddhist culture. And you know the value of compassion, kindness in the world. You know it, it's um, a lot of it's just like a lot of it's common sense principles. You know because you know you just could look at some of the crazy things some of um, military political leaders are doing around the world, and uh, to, to see the extent of it. But um, so what happens is for, for all of us, we, we've moved. You know it might have taken a, a couple of lifetimes to reach this point, but we're moving from uh, from the unwholesome. We're moving towards the wholesome, you know, that we're moving in that direction. So, you know, you can do that in many, many different ways with the, um, with the practice. And then we reach a point where we move from the unwholesome through to the wholesome, to the, to the, the pinnacle of the wholesome, and then you relinquish both wholesome and unwholesome. You, you, you relinquish both love and hate, uh, um, you know, attachment to wholesome states. You know, the, I mean, the, 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 say the mind of the arahant is just pure dhamma you know when he when he moves and thinks and speaks that his mind is an expression or his or her mind is an expression of dhamma and they're actually they're coming from a a real foundation in dhamma it's but the person you know even though there's nothing inside them you you it's it's like watching a an incredibly wise puppet so to speak you see this external behavior phenomena but inside, there's, there's, you know, there's no one in there driving that. But the, but the mind itself, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's completely in, in line with Dhamma, the way they live their life, the way they, they teach. Their, all the impurities are, are, are completely uh, removed from the, the, say, the pure chit, you know, the, uh, from the mind leaving the, uh, the pure chitta, which is a Dhamma, a higher Dhamma uh, uh, in itself. So... Um, and then you've got, you know, naturally you've got, um, so within the uh, monastics, if, if they don't stick with the suttas from start to finish, uh, because you really, you know, especially, you know, if, if you're in any kind of teaching position, you, you just do not, whether you're a lay or monastic, you do not um, trust 100% your personal views and opinions because, you know, essentially they're, they're deluded. Um, you know, and even with myself, I always keep checking because I go over suttas every day. You know, I have I've got got text to speech. I you know I read them, I do word search, and I'm I easily easily I, sp- I probably spend nothing less than thirty minutes to an hour on suttas every single day, and you you get a you get a feel for it. So when you're actually talking with people, like I don't consider myself to have an incredible knowledge base, but you can feel it. You know, when you're when you're dialoguing, when you're chatting with people, um, you, you get a much you, there's, there's more clarity because you don't get com- completely um, sidetracked and um, uh, by, by one's own personal biases, opinions. You know, my my personal likes and dislikes. You know, the, the, by absorbing more and more sutta knowledge constantly, constantly, because there's so much of it um, that your views and opinions are uh, essentially are, are influenced and coloured by the the dharma content. And you know, you, you you start to think more clearly, you speak more clearly. You, you know, not to say that the, not to say that person's going to be their behaviour is going to be absolutely angelic, 
uh, on a day-to-day basis. But you know, they're, they're, it's like you, you're looking at this conditioning process. So we condition ourselves with the five precepts. We condition ourselves with suttas, with meditation, and then we're moving towards this increasing wholesomeness and eventually transcending both wholesome and unwholesome, and then breaking through to the path. So you now you will see that with some um, monastics, you've got to be very, you know, people. some people get into um, philosophy and mythology and this and that, but, you know, my, my attitude is that you've got to be careful because these people who, who were teaching mythology um, who teach you know people like Jung and teaching archetypes and Sigmund Freud and all and all and all these uh, other people? Um, you know, es- essentially, I, I I'm not going to trust what these people say and what they write in their books because they they're not enlightened people. They don't they don't have the right view, which is reliable. You know, especially with the, the, say the, the the right view of an arahant is just is. Um, is you know essentially it's quite pure, and you could trust that person to a, a very very great degree. You know what they teach, their advice, this and that. So, um, but you know people people like to play with all sorts of different views and concepts, and and they like to pull it into the dharma field, you know, into um, dharma practice. But you've got to be um, quite careful because it can be quite contradictory because you know i mean why why does that person want to get into that why why do they want to get into um jungian archetypes i mean why do why do, why do they want to play with that stuff you know it's um it may be quite interesting and you know it's quite stimulating and uh and whatnot but um you know th- th- it's not it's not based in truth uh principles and um Essentially, I don't. For myself, I mean, I, I yeah, I don't. I don't read broadly. I, I, I stick with the suttas. I stick with the uh, the forest masters, Achan Brahm's teaching. That you know, the very the key, the really really solid solid teachers with a good um, track record. Um, was was there any other points, Lynn? Or you're right. Yeah. Sorry if I might have gone on a bit. But, mm, yep. Yep. Yeah, so if he, um, a, a good, a good, maybe a good book to get a hold of is Achan Tanisro's Wings to Awakening. You know, he's got, uh, because he, he is sort of based, he, he does use uh, some different words and terminology, but he's quite, he's well, he's well on track. You know, he's, he's done so much study with the sutras and the material that he writes, you know, it's, it's, it's quite accurate. He doesn't go off uh, very much at all. Sorry? Uh, Achan Tanisro from, um, where is he now, U- from the US, from, uh, oh, what's the name of that place, I can't remember, oh, what's the name of that monastery, you, you'll find it easily, Wing, Wings, to Awa- Wings to Awakening, the thick volume, Achan Tanisro, he's got chapters devoted to the 30, 37 Bojangas, and he gives, he gives the f- virtually, I mean, f- quite, you know, quite almost full detail, Plus, and with the sutta references, so as he as he gives, you know, he's quite an intellectual man. He gives his own personal perspective, but he constantly keeps drawing the suttas in. So he basically, you know, he he is 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 um is quite accurate his his teaching format. So check, yeah, check that one out. And um, naturally, the, the the normal suttas. This is the good thing if you know for any of you who are who are in, really into suttas. Um, you know, because th- th- especially like word search, you know, you could get the Kindle suttas, put it on your laptop, uh, put it on your smartphone, your tablet, and then you can find specific things. You know, you, so for example, you zero in on a particular area, and you get the full references through all the four um, nikayas. So when you study something, you know, you you go right through, you go right through the four volumes, and you get the full detail. It's quite it's quite useful. Yeah, T H A N I double S A R O. Yeah, but he also because he gives his books away. I mean, they're very the the actual cosmetically they're very nice, the uh, quite glossy publications. So, but he um, he's got the support network to give books away 
for free. So if the centre was really interested in easily a dozen volumes or, or more, um, you can uh, send him an email and then see what he what he thinks because it's, it's quite a useful one. Plus the plus the PDF. You know, you, you've got PDF versions of virtually all his books. You just go to his um, uh, web. You go to say like uh, dial up. Um, so you could say Achantanistro books for download. So all those major volumes, virtually the vast majority of his books, even the small publications, which focus on specific dhammas and teaching. Um, so th- things like the four frames of reference, four stations of mindfulness. He'll do. He'll do like a, one of these glossy little books, you know, half an inch thick. But because it, it's it's all sutta based, so you know, so you know it's accurate to a great degree. And he has many, many, many of those books, and the vast majority you'll find in PDF or HTML. And then you can, you know, if you've got your your uh, smartphone, tablet, laptop, you can you can load it, and then you can word search, and you can find exactly what you're what you're looking for. And um, but yeah, he's got a good range, very good range of material. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. True, true Dharma and Dharma objects. True Dharma and Dharma objects. Are you, are you able to clarify that? What, I don't really, I don't fully understand you. True Dharma and Dharma objects. Are you able to expand that? Five, five, five. The five sense bases. Um, all right. What as far as what investigation or understanding? Um, yes. Yeah, so. What you would do is, for example, they have the they have the uh, the format the one of the, uh, the 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 principle where with your sensory experience you have you have input coming in through uh, the five senses. So, just imagine uh, an example would be uh, say the say the say the things that you you actually see you know from moment to moment, and. Um, what you can actually pay attention to. This is this is a, another field of attention, where as you as you see things, as you see different people, as you see trees and flowers, see a puppy dog or a kitten cross your path. Actually, you can you can you you watch your um, emotional mindset. You know the way you, you look, the way your mind responds towards uh, different objects because with the with one's um, uh, emotional framework. It's it's a it's a key principle because with human beings that if we, we need feeling in order to understand you know we need emotion in order to uh, to be sensitive to have awareness and to have raw material for contemplation so as you as you get sense experience coming in through the through the eyes or say through the ear you you see how that affects you on the emotional level and you pay attention to that. And um, develop it as a skill, and you actually investigate it. So that becomes like a, f- a field of dharma based on the sense bases. And um, but you know, so that that's one field of, of one field of say investigative awareness. And then you have this other thing with with uh, say sound, color, um, you know, or, or even emotion based on the kind of emotional response you you get when you when you hear like different things. You, you can actually sharpen that, increase increase one's awareness. Um, but in a, in a general, you know, if a person found that difficult, they, they could just inv- just inv- investigate, um, the, you know, their personality, their, their likes and dislikes, just in a general sense, you know, the way they feel emotionally in a general sense, which is easier to work with. And then you can focus on just one object. It could be, it could be, um, um, you know, any of the five five sense bases or. Or say like a particular enlightenment factor, or it could be something specific, but it's quite sharp. And um, so the, the the business with the say for example the sense object and uh, the pure dharma is when when you draw your attention um, towards say uh, specific dhammas, like you know sets of dhammas, five um, five faculties, seven enlightenment factors. Um, Four right efforts, <clears throat> all the different sets that you see within the within the um, the thirty seven bojangas, thirty seven alignment factors, 
Um, when you investigate those with, within the fourth foundation of mindfulness, investigation of, of dhammas, and, and these, are, these are, are the very, you know, so you're looking at the very, um, the, the key teachings, you know, as you understand the, 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 the foundation principles, key teachings, and what, you, what you're aiming at is by zeroing in on that particular Dharma principle. You, you're trying to sharpen the mind. You, you're trying to increase the depth of your understanding. Because, you know, say, for example, if I think about, if I spend five minutes thinking about the flavour of ice cream, you know, it's, it's not really very useful at, at all. But if you focus on something like, on something really specific, like, say, for example, you have an, a nice meal, or you, you're, at a, you're at a restaurant and you have, well, you could have like, I mean, uh, maybe it could be like five, six course meal or, or something. And then you you've just focus on the way, just the, the taste of the food actually affects you uh, emotionally. That's, that's a much sharper mode of investigation. So the, the, the principle is, um, for, especially for people who are quite intellectual, uh, or the mind is very, very sharp and fast, um, you know, they may find that quite useful because each person, depending on the, on the personality, the nature of the personality, uh, some people have got more ability, say with the four foundations of mindfulness, um, some people are more successful with the first, some people are very good with um, investigating mind states, the, you know, the third one, and um, but for highly intellectual people, investigation of dhammas, it's, it suits their personality. So you, you can um, experiment in different ways and then you see what actually works um, for you. Right. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, b- I'll better get on to the other ones so you people may, have, you may be busy. Okay, so where are we? Striving. So that's the um, uh, Angutra Nikaya. 212, Strivings, the Book of Twos, page 140. Bhikkhus, there are these two strivings that are hard to achieve in the world. What two? The striving of lay people who dwell at home for the purpose of presenting monastics with robes, arms, food, lodging and medicine, provisions for the sick, and the striving of those who have gone forth from their household life into homelessness for the relinquishment of all acquisitions. These are the two strivings that are hard to achieve in the world. Of these two strivings, because the foremost is the striving for the relinquishment of all acquisitions. Therefore, because you should train yourself thus, we will strive for the relinquishment of all acquisitions. It is in such a way that you should train yourself. But uh, yeah, we, we, did, we did touch on that, touch on that reasonably well. Did anyone have any additional viewpoints on that one? I can, I can expand on it a little, to a small degree. So. Yeah. So with the um, so with the no, naturally with the strike with the striving of the lay the lay disciples, as we we did cover a couple of um, points previously. But with the when you, you know if you look at the, compa- the compa- with the comparison relinquishment of all acquisitions, the, the Buddha was talking about the relinquishment of the say the underlying defilements in the world, the relinquishment of the five aggregates. So you, you're looking at the essentially the um, uh, the cessation uh, of that cessation of the defilements, which actually block the path, which stop you from breaking through, and um, the relinquishment of the of the five khandas, which is that continual that connecting link in samsara. Then the, the samsara is considered to be the unbroken chain of the five aggregates uh, within your your personal experience, the, the body and the four mental aggregates. When that is not uh, say which is not bro- broken in relation with one's dharma penetration continues on. That's that's considered to be the um, it was the, the Buddhist reference. Say that's considered to actually be samsara, that unbroken chain of the um, five aggregates. Yeah, I think we've already covered that one pretty well with uh, some of the material that Lynn broke up. So. Um, But that same thing again, yeah, with the with the lay disciples, you know, just yeah, just don't be just don't be content, uh, you know, just with supporting the monastics, you know, really really work on your own practice to the best of your 
uh, ability, but with the monastics because they're you know they're they're doing this full time. Um, you know they they have to they have to aim for that. They have to aim for the goal. You know for the uh, to the best uh, of their ability. So I move on with the. No one had any extra points on that because we virtually covered that one. So with the the, the next one, a good Nikaya, uh, the Book of Twos, one thirty to one thirty three. Aspiring because a bhikkhu endowed with faith rightly aspiring should aspire. Thus, may I become like Sariputra and Moggallana. This is the standard and criterion for my bhikkhu disciples. That is Sariputra and Moggallana. Because a bhikkhuni endowed with faith rightly inspiring should aspire. Thus, may I become like the bhikkhunis Kama and Uplawana. This is the standard and criterion for my bhikkhuni disciples. That is the bhikkhunis Kama and Uplawana. Because a male lay follower, lay follower endowed with faith, rightly aspiring, should aspire thus, may I become like Chitta the householder and Hataka of Alawi. This is the standard and criterion for my male lay disciples, that is Chitta the householder and Hataka of Alawi. Alawi. Because a female lady, lay follower endowed with faith, rightly aspiring, should aspire thus, may I become like the female lay followers Kut, Kuchutara and Welukatanki. Nandamata. This is the standard and criterion for my female lay disciples. That is the female lay disciples, Kuta Tachara and Wijuka Kantaki Nandamata. So, have any of you got any personal points on that? Any ideas? All right, so what, what this, you know, it's with the. Yeah, so what, what um, I had a little point here that uh, with the, especially with this business, with. Um, Uh, aspiring to be like these uh, very, say, high-standing, uh, high-standing uh, monastics and and lay disciples within uh, Dhamma practice, and I, I think it's, I think it's a, quite a useful thing, a quite a beneficial thing uh, to do that. But with many of us, you know, because we're not supermen, superwomen, uh, we've got to be quite realistic as well. You know, uh, with with um, the vast majority of us. That you know easily you've been practicing for five years, say five to ten years, and you will have a reasonable understanding with the weaks and strengths of your personality, how much mental and physical energy you have, how much practice you can do, and the kind of things that essentially which just which which will completely <laughs> completely ruin you know your your meditation or uh, create difficulties for you, make it very difficult to. Uh, to focus, develop mindfulness, and whatnot. So, really coming to an understanding of your, of your personality. You know what, um, what makes you up, what you're capable of, the the kind of approach you should use to dhamma when you're using like a step by step, you know, uh, principle with the gradual training. So, yeah, very very useful. But I yeah I I tend to have a more you know like even though I I'm very very interested in Nachan Cha's teaching style. You know, had a very very strong wisdom faculty um, that, you know, I would never pretend to be like, uh, you know, even pretend to be like Kachan Cha because he's basically working at the Superman level, you know, people like Kachan Longpo Plian and uh, Achan Dun, you know, and these, these people could, they could w- walk and sit meditation, and they did this for years, walk and sit meditation, for, I mean, a 10 hour day is just a normal day for these people and, and in the Rains Retreat they would do up to 16 hours of walking and sitting uh, a day, and and they would just do this seven days a week, and they, you know, uh, during the during the panza, and depending how much responsibility they had, and they they could live they could live on, you know, they could live on rice and water for, um, oh, I mean, for weeks at a time, and not even bat, you know, not even sweat. You know, they could they could sleep for one, you know, one to two hours. Uh, Long Paul Plian was admonished by a very senior monk from Thailand when he was teaching in Singapore. Their paths crossed. Long Long Paul Plian was supposedly a soda partner at that point, and um, he wasn't incredibly not incredibly busy with the Singaporean appointment. Um, and that senior te- that se- that senior arahant actually admonished him. And, and and when they were talking about practice and whatnot, because they were they're meditation monks, that he really felt that he wasn't putting enough. I think he was sleeping when he was with the. Uh, I think he was sleeping. Um, Possibly about four. Possibly when he was with the Singaporean group, maybe f- three to four hours a night, and um, and then after you know it's quite funny in a sense. It's, I wouldn't say comical, but the teacher admonished him and said, "Look, you know," he said, "You've got to." He said, "You've only got realistically maybe another thirty years." He said, "You've got to put more forth more effort." He said, "Even though you 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 know you're with a group 
uh, you know, teaching form, and he said, "You've got to put more, put forth more effort." So, you know, he cut his he's cut his sleep time down to two hours uh, a night, and you know, he just spent he but he spent much more time in deep samadhi just to compensate for the um, the lack of of uh, say mental rest. So, but you know, very few people can do that. I've I've seen monks in Thailand, you know, reasonably tough guys who cut their sleep down to three hours a night and, and they're like the walking dead you know they're, they're, just, they're just constantly falling asleep they, they can barely hold themselves up you know it's, it's, you can use willpower but the thing is if you're not getting uh good results you know that particular approach um may not necessarily cut the ice so with all of you and and myself you know you 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 can you've got a you've got a workable you've got workable limits uh you know you're strong in some areas possibly not so strong in others and um, you know, you know when you know you should have an awareness when to push, when to relax. Um, you know how to uh, practice dharma in different ways. You know, using different principles. You know, you've got thirty-seven factors. Um, you know, you've got different ways to sharpen mindfulness, different ways to investigate. So, you know, and, and dharma is an in, it's an incredibly big field. It, when people first begin to meditate, they think, oh, you know, yeah, watch the breath, and yeah, oh, it's all, really, all very nice, get peaceful, and it, but. Over the years, the, the, the knowledge and the awareness, it, it just keeps increasing and increasing. Meditation, and, and uh, especially meditation, and, and Dhamma as well, but it's an incredibly broad field. I mean, what you can, what you can know, you know, over the years. And, um, but, yeah, so, yeah, you know, each person has to pace themselves because the, the, I, think the, I think the key principle is that, you know, if, you, if you're going to be doing this for, like, the next... 20, 30 years, or say 40 years, whatever, um, you know, you, you want to basically go the distance. Don't, 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 you know, don't burn yourself out, you know, just keep yourself in a comfortable range and then just keep going, you know, like day by day by day, step by step and, and, um, and um, constantly sharpen, you know, use the, always keep applying the wisdom faculty no matter what you, you do. Um, you know, try to have the wisdom faculty watching over all areas of your life, watching over mindfulness, watching over the application of energy, watching over sense restraint and the five precepts, because that, that's where the, um, you know, where you um, keep, sh- you know, sharpening your your personal uh, development, you know, and you do you do that on a daily basis, you know. Like five years, you should be in a pretty good, you know, pretty good state as far as personal practice. Is there any other points at all? Or? So, question one, Russell from Hawaii. Being lay people limited by our secular responsibilities and can't ordain until later in life, which is not by choice, but intent on following the Dhamma all the way through, how do we build upon our conceptual knowledge to develop it into wisdom? While still a lay person, knowing that death could come at any moment, I may not even be able to ordain in this lifetime. Hmm. Uh. How do we, how, so how, the key point, how do we build upon our conceptual knowledge to develop it into wisdom while still a lay person knowing that death could come at any moment and may not even be able to ordain in this life? So with your, what, what I encourage people to do is um, with the, the different mo- the modes of investigation, different modes of, of um, Dharma investigation, that I would I would encourage people whatever whatever line of inquiry, whatever questions you ask yourself or you when you're looking at life, uh, your life experience, your personality, uh, relationships with friends, people you work with, um, is to try to keep try to keep the mode of investigation within Dharma concepts. So you know just the, the classics. Um, you know, say for example, the three characteristics of, of existence. Um, uh, some people they, they think this is a very, very simplistic 
uh, kind of, um, say, perceptive understanding, but it's, it's very, very useful because when you, when you have the three, character, uh, three characteristics with Anika, du, uh, Dukkha and Atar, that um, there's, you, you can use this kind of correlation where a, a Nietzsche, when you, because all universal phenomena, both all mind-body phenomena, is basically um, is imbued with the three characteristics of existence that um, when you when you investigate one essential principle you know I use the principle of the say the a, a tree where the, the the trunk of the tree is um, is a Nietzsche dukkha anatta and as you as the as you as the tree rises up and you form branches buds and leaves that you get these these dhammas, these um, these insights which actually branch off from the main trunk section because all all the all the um, the outlying phenomena, the connecting phenomena, is is affected by these primary principles, these primary dhammas, and um, it increases your uh, awareness of dharma principles. Like even like I've been working on this this emptiness sanya for uh, a couple of months, but it, it's it's got an it's got an effect. Where it it, in, it increases your um, your understanding of other uh, dharma principles as well because they're all interconnected. You know, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces are are connected uh, together, like in a web. And um, so, when you zero in on on key key dhammas, uh, it could be things like um, investigation of the five aggregates, um, applying the four foundations of mindfulness. That you 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 you're sharpening your uh, wisdom faculty because you're 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 directing your mind actually in line with core dharma uh, principles and um, and when you do this and you do this for many months uh, several years the the mind keeps getting it, it gets more and more proficient it gets it gets sharper it gets faster. You're, you've got this ability to catch mind states as, as soon as they come up. You know, you're, you're essentially you're on, you're on the job, and um, you know you're you're examining, you're dissecting, you're coming to an understanding um, of those principles. Because as as you investigate, you not only develop the ability to actually approach things in different ways. You know, you can you can analyze and investigate things from many many different perspectives. Um, but you actually sharpen the speed of the mind, the, sh- the speed and the awareness uh, of the mind, and uh, because you know we, we, it's, it, it's, in, it, it's something which is in line with the enlightenment principles. That uh, you know, the first factor, mindfulness. Number two, investigation of dhammas. Number three, energy. Energy is set rolling um, in the mind, and that energy. When people have mental energy, the mind is is much. It's much more quick. It's bright. Um, it's it's um, it can it can swap and change. It can you know you, the ability to the, the memory the memory tends to be a, uh, tends to be a bit better with with mental energy, and uh, naturally the mind speed um, increases to at least a small degree, and um, so you know you, you actually develop that as a skill. So yeah, I would I would try you know make yourself fully aware of key dharma principles and then and use those as your tools to actually sharpen your uh, you know sharpen your um, your wisdom faculty sharpen the mind and uh, naturally you know you, you you help to it does help to increase understanding increase uh, one you know the ability to let go of um, phenomena increase um, detachment increase the stability the equanimity uh, of the mind I mean it even increases kindness and compassion because you know, you know, if you if you if you're investigating phenomena, you develop awareness, sensitivity. You develop wisdom. You know, you can just see the suffering, which which what the, the difficulties which some people go through. You know, when we did that, when we did the the funeral for for Peter on Friday, and and I could really feel the grief from from Peter's son. You know, as, as he he was, you know, he had his head on 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 Peter's casket and he was like he was crying his eyes out you know and, and I was standing to the side and um, I mean I wasn't crying myself but I thought you know you could really you could really feel that that young man's grief and um, you know and this and this is this is a dhamma you know even though maybe Peter Peter's family they're Buddhist they're, they're good people you know all of us are, uh, all of us are susceptible to this I mean I, I had a dream 
a couple of days ago where my, my mother was standing in front of me and she, she has epilepsy. She was going into um, a seizure. She was losing consciousness. My father rushed to support her so she didn't fall. And then my, my father just, he, he, um, he started to fall away and um, he fell to the ground. My mother was still standing. My father uh, was, was, was laying on the ground and I, I rushed forward and he, w- he was, you know, he was just like laying there like, uh, you know, he, he, wasn't like, he wasn't like blue, but he was, he was just lay- laying there completely still. And, um, I, and uh, you know, I reached down to check the pulse. I couldn't feel a pulse. And I thought, oh, I thought, oh, no, you know, my, 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 father, my father's gone, you know, he's, he's, he's died. And, and um, it was a, it w- I was dreaming and, and I was actually crying in the, in the dream. And I, when I woke up, I still had the tears rolling down my cheeks. And, and um, I actually, I, at that point, I actually knew what it felt like to actually to, to lose my, my father and actually you know, to, to, to believe that my father had actually passed away you know, in the dream state and I was, I was deluded but, um, and I, I, could, I could really sense where that young man was coming from when he was, he was, you know, when he had, you know, he was laying his head on his father's coffin and he was, he was crying his eyes out, you know, and, and um, you know, and I, could, I could really feel that because I, I had that emotion to a lesser degree uh, during that dream state, but it's, it's quite useful because when it comes time, you know, that's exactly what's going to what's going to happen. You know, with my parents, I'll probably I probably will cr- I will cry when my mother and father die. So, um, you know, but that increasing sensitivity um, and and awareness, you know, you, you if you by by you you know keep yeah keeping the mind in line with dharma principles with the mode of investigation. And you, you find that your faculties they they will sharpen uh, in a much more in a much shorter uh, period of time because you know people can think about all sorts of things they can you know all sorts of useless things which are of absolutely no value but if you see the quality of your practice increasing with any particular approach then you know it's um, it's working for you. So was was there any other questions at all? Okay, so we'll call it an afternoon. I hope you enjoyed yourself. (laughs) Thank you very much.